Tuxedo Gang, hello. It's good to be back, two uploads in one week. Whose channel is this? Don't worry, I'll probably disappear for another three months after this video, so make sure you slap the f***ing turds out of that subscribe button. Anyway, my presence here doesn't matter. There's a new trailer for Breath of the Wild 2, so like it or not, we need to spend some time together, because I am gonna make some predictions here. And no, I haven't abused my friendship with Luna to see into the future on this one. This is all my big brain at work here. See, I'm a bit of a Zelda scholar. And honestly, Luna probably already beat Breath of the Wild 2 considering she's an oracle and all that. Come to think of it, I haven't heard from her in a little while. Hmm. Anyway, it is time to equip our tinfoil hats because we're gonna be talking about some theories. A game theory. This all started with a video I saw on YouTube. Some unironic big brain reversed the trailer and realized that the score to the trailer is none other than the tapestry song from the legend involving the calamity. Go watch the video, it's kinda sick. The link will be in the description. So that video got me thinking about the floating islands about the music cues. Nintendo likes their music cues. I think if this isn't some big coincidence, which I find that hard to believe, I think it's Nintendo's way of hinting at the fact that we're going to be dealing with multiple timelines here. I know what some of you might be thinking, oh no, not more timeline stuff. The timeline is so not convoluted and slapped together. I have some good news. I don't think it's as complicated as that, but I do think it has to do with the timeline of Breath of the Wild 1. I think we're actually seeing two different heroes in the trailer. The first one is the Link we're used to seeing, the one in the champion's tunic, and he's wielding the Master Sword. This might be a complete shocker to some of you, but I think he'll be on the timeline following the events of the first Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild 2, Electric Boogaloo, the sequel, this time it's personal. The footage where we see Link in the green tunic toga dress thing, you know, where he has the long hair and the weird arm, I have a feeling that's not our current Link. That's the Link from the tapestry. In other words, that's the Link who defeated the first Calamity 10,000 years ago. I think Breath of the Wild 2 is going to chronicle both the events after the second Calamity while simultaneously telling the story of the events leading up to the first Calamity. The reverse music from the tapestry, which matches up to the trailer, kind of links this all together. G get it? Link? It connects them. And while the music motif is an interesting piece of evidence to this idea, I think the floating islands provide even more evidence. Allow me to explain. The floating islands create an interesting issue with Breath of the Wild 1. Why didn't we see them? If you look closely at the trailer, you can see the landmarks from Breath of the Wild 1 from the islands, which implies that they can't be that high up in the sky. You can't necessarily see them from the ground though. Like look at this sweeping wide shot. Where are all the islands? Maybe they'll justify it in the story and say, oh my god, the islands were floating there all along and you just didn't even see them. Zelda is no stranger to hiding secrets in plain sight. Just think about the lens of truth and how that worked in Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. But I do think they would have a little more finesse than just saying, no way, bro, you don't even have to think about it. They've been there all along. You just didn't see them. But think about it. If there's two timelines and two different heroes, the islands are probably from the past. That could explain why they're not there anymore. Maybe they fell out of the sky. Maybe they exploded. Maybe they just, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows, it looks like those floating islands have shrines on them. Maybe these islands crash out of the sky at some point, forming the shrines that we know in Breath of the Wild 1. Think about the potential stories you can get out of having two different heroes on two different timelines. Maybe current Link learns a method of gaining experience from his past lives, some Avatar The Last Airbender shit, the good Avatar, not the bad one. In order to truly defeat Ganon, he needs to unlock crap from his past lives. Wouldn't be the first time a past incarnation of the hero taught our current hero something. Some of you might be skeptical about basing all this on the music. That's cool, man. That's cool. It's not like Nintendo has a history of reversing their music or anything like that. Here's the Ballad of the Goddess. Here's the Ballad of the Goddess backwards. Here's Zelda's lullaby. F 
Funny little aside here, music is actually the reason I wanted to have this little chat with you. Back when I played Breath of the Wild, you know, the first game, I wanted to make a video predicting the re-release of Link's Awakening. Because the first time I got to Hyrule Castle, I noticed an interesting musical motif. The song that plays there incorporates a couple of different classic Zelda songs, but one of them is the Ballad of the Windfish. <laughs> Some people just don't hear it, and if you're one of those people, it's okay, but I, I can't help you. Going back to the trailer, there is no shortage of Malice. For those of you who aren't familiar, Malice is the purple goop stuff, you know? Gwyneth Paltrow, is that you? In the first trailer, we saw the Malice eat a mouse, or whatever, it overtakes a mouse. In this one, we see it being much more... Malice-y. If we look at this frame here, you can see it's all over Link's arm. But if we look a little closer, oh goodness, it's on the Master Sword. There are two thoughts about this, generally speaking. One is that Link, maybe just his arm, gets corrupted by the Calamity and can no longer wield the Master Sword. Or two, and I personally like this one a lot better, the Calamity corrupts the Master Sword. It would really pay off the rusted, chipped up Master Sword imagery we've seen. It would make for some serious drama. I mean, how are you going to start a game with the Master Sword? You know, where's the drama? Maybe the Master Sword is corrupted and needs to go back to where it was first forged to be purified. And we all know what game that happened in. Now you might say, sweet, you're an idiot. Skyward Sword had you traveling from numerous floating islands in the sky. Wow! Like Skyloft. Floating islands in the trailer, the same falling animation from Skyward Sword, a Skyward Sword remake comes out next month. Look, a Skyward Sword remake is basically a money grab for Nintendo, but at the same time, I think a lot of people didn't play that one. I mean, none of my friends did, and I will die on this hill. The story and art of that game was so incredible, it's one of my favorites. It would have been a fan favorite, but the controls sucked balls. This remake might be Nintendo's little wink wink nudge nudge to get more people to experience Skyward Sword, to understand its significance significance in the Zelda universe before drastically referencing it in the new game. And while we're talking about Skyward Sword, let's take a quick listen to the score towards the end of the new trailer. That sounds vaguely reminiscent of something, doesn't it? It makes me think of Fi. Yeah, I call her Fi. I, I, you don't say feet, you say fight, so I, I would argue that it's pronounced Fi. Quick spoiler alert for Skyward Sword, skip to this time code if you haven't played it. When Link and Fi went their separate ways, we know that Fi goes into a deep sleep and her consciousness is still there. I mean, we even see a hint of it in Breath of the Wild. So who knows, maybe Fi will make an appearance in Breath of the Wild too. Alright, the last thing I want to talk about is the big green boy. I don't think the big green boy is a new enemy, honestly, just based on the relatively simple color palette of the series, I know this is really high concept sh but usually evil is red or magenta, and usually good is bluish tealish green. Look at our big green boy. You see that energy flowing through him? It's bluish tealish green. So I think it's fairly safe to say this thing isn't necessarily evil. He might look like a bad boy, but I think he's a good boy. That said, I do think you're gonna fight him. First off, if the Master Sword or Link himself is corrupted and you venture into these holy lands to purify the sword, the big green boy is probably gonna be guarding the place. Corrupted Malice enters, he's gonna be like beep boop, I'm gonna slap the f*** out of this guy. It could also be the case that you have to fight this big green boy in order to learn something. Going back to my previous point about Shade, while you did fight him, he wasn't an enemy, he was merely there to teach you. And when you look at that bluish tealish green aura going around the big green boy, and then you see the new powers, and you see the hero surrounded by that bluish tealish green aura, some people would call that a link? <laughs> Well, hey guys, thank you so much for stopping by and listening to me ramble about Zelda. I love talking about Zelda games and theory and lore and all that stuff. I actually have some other videos on the channel about Breath of the Wild, but they're like four years old and I haven't watched them in a while, so I don't know. They might suck balls, but you can go check them out if you want to. But hey, more importantly, leave your theories in the comments below. What do you, uh, what do you think is happening in this beautiful game? I'm sure it's gonna kick ass either way, so it doesn't matter, but I I guess theorizing and, and looking at trailers and all that fun stuff is something to hold us over considering this game is probably going to come out in 40 years. I know it said 2022, but I'll believe that when I see it. Anyway, guys, slap that subscribe. I'll see you when I see you. Bye.